Now we're going to talk about the politics in the late 1840s, early 1850s. National politics, but a politics that is going to impact, in very important ways, the West and the uh, settlement of the West. Now, just kind of a, uh, a refresher, 20 years, almost 30 years before the period we're talking about, in 1820, there had been a famous compromise called the Compromise of 1820, brokered by Kentucky Senator Henry Clay, that had arisen as a result of the fact that uh, Missouri uh, was wanting to be uh, made a state, and uh, Missouri was, was wanting to be made a slave state, and that was going to disrupt the balance, the delicate balance, because another slave state means two more pro-slavery senators and however many congressmen. So the compromise was that Maine would be brought in also at around the same time as a free state to counterbalance Missouri coming as a slave state. And then the main, the main part of the compromise was that this line was going to be established at the uh, uh, 3630 parallel, that is the, uh, the northern border of Arkansas Territory, which, other than the boot heel of Missouri, basically follows the contours of the northern borders of North Carolina and Tennessee. That line, stretching all the way across the United States, would be a dividing line of slavery from 1820 on. So any new state that... Uh, is brought into the Union after 1820. If it's below that line, they can have slavery. If it's above that line, they cannot. Now, any state that was above that line that already had slavery, including Missouri, got to keep it. So, uh, as you can see, that impacts, you know, um, essentially, Arkansas Territory is uh, what would later become the state of Arkansas and most of Oklahoma, and that's really the only area that was impacted so far as being able to have slavery. But then there was that U.S.-Mexican War from 1846 to 1848, and notice what happens. All that area in green gets added to the United States, starting with Texas, which was annexed, but Mexico still claimed most of it uh, until the end of the war. And look at that line that goes across Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, etc. Texas is under that line. Arizona and New Mexico are under that line. And about 40% of California is under that line. Which means all of a sudden there are lots of new opportunities to have new states in the future that could have slavery according to the Compromise of 1820. And many people would claim, and in fact did claim, that was the whole point of the war with Mexico, which mostly southern politicians had wanted to engage in, so that they could get that territory and expand slavery and get more pro-slavery senators and congressmen as a result, thereby consolidating further their power in Washington and their power to protect slavery. Well, that is a different kettle of fish. And even as the war is just getting underway, there is debate. Debate in the hallowed halls of Congress and throughout the United States of what's going to happen to any new territory that might be taken from Mexico, not knowing at the time just how big a chunk they were going to take. So, in 1846, as part of a, a larger bill uh, about uh, uh, the war, Congressman David Wilmot of Pennsylvania, a Republican, proposed a proviso, uh, an addition uh, to the, the bill being considered. That was called the Wilmot Proviso, which basically stated that no slavery would be allowed in any territory that might be acquired from Mexico. And this passed the House of Representatives where Wilmot was serving at the time and where he introduced it. But it didn't pass the Senate. It failed in the Senate. Therefore, it did not become law. But the important thing to note here is that there was enough support for Wilmot's position of not allowing any slavery anywhere 
in the territories taken from Mexico, that it passed the House of Representatives. Now, another important thing to note about uh, Wilmot and his introduction of this, uh, of this proviso is how he explained it. He said, quote, I have no squeamish sensitiveness on the subject of slavery, no morbid sympathy for the slave, but I stand for the integrity of the territory. It shall remain free, so far as my voice and vote can aid in the preservation of its free character. That's important, okay? He's saying, all right, I don't want slavery out there. Don't get me wrong and think I like slaves or feel sorry for them in any way whatsoever. I don't. Let's make that clear. But I want, it to, I want to maintain the integrity of the territory and keep it free. We'll talk in a moment about what the reasoning was for keeping it free if you didn't feel sympathy for slaves. Uh, in fact, let's just uh, let's keep going, and then we'll come back and revisit Wilmot's words in just a, just a couple of minutes here. All right. Free soil. Uh, that was, uh, well, that's what uh, Wilmot was in favor of, that any new soil be free soil. And that became a really big movement in the North. Uh, in fact, they started calling themselves, the people who supported this idea, free soilers, which sounds like something from a diaper ad, uh, kind of unfortunate, but there it is. Uh, and their, their motto was free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. Now, here is why those northerners, and there were a lot of them, wanted to prevent the spread of slavery, and yet were eager to let people know it's not because we're not racist or anything. Okay, They wanted to prevent slavery to protect white people in the north and in any new territories and new states. Okay? To protect small farmers because if there's slavery plantation owners are going to gobble up the land as they had done from the beginning starting in Virginia and the small independent yeoman farmer who wants to go west and settle with his family is going to be cut out of the equation also white laborers white workers uh, the free soilers argued are hurt by slavery because why would you hire someone for wages when you could buy somebody and just use them from then on uh, and even even breed them and produce new property from them, uh, which was overall cheaper than paying wages. So wherever there's slavery, working class white people have a hard time making a living. So their, their desire to keep the western states free of slavery as Wilmot pointed out, was not because they liked black people. It's kind of like almost, he sounded scared that somebody might think that. It's because they loved white people. Um, the right white people, the working class, the farmers, the ones that uh, were not part of that southern slaveocracy, as some people called it, the aristocracy of the plantation owners. The Free Soil Party also, as one of its planks, wanted newer better, more liberal homesteading laws, uh, which, by the way, eventually happened under uh, Abraham Lincoln about, oh, 14 years later, uh, laws that would make it easier for settlers to go west and claim, claim property from among the uh, public lands that were out there to make it as cheap as possible, free if possible, and that is, by the way, how it wound up being when Lincoln finally pushed through the Homestead Act, and I think it was 1862, that you didn't even have to pay for land that you got out west. All you had to do was pay $10 for a filing fee, claim your spot of land if no one else had claimed it, and you had five years to make improvements on it. And if at the end of five years you had, it was yours. So that idea originated with the Free Soil Party because... Farmers moving west and workers moving west and having opportunities to improve their lives was the real reason that those folks were opposed to slavery. 
Now, there were some people among the, the party that was opposed to slavery on moral grounds, but not all of them were. They formed a political party in 1848 called the Free Soil Party. And as their presidential candidate, they put forward former president Martin Van Buren, who had been defeated uh, when he ran for re-election in 1840 by William Henry Harrison. And Van Buren, uh, his partner, the uh, person the party chose as his vice presidential running mate, was Charles Francis Adams, the son of John Quincy Adams. Now, this is significant. Because if you're not aware, um, Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams were bitter arch enemies. They ran two very, very bitter presidential campaigns against one another that just got down, dirty, mudslinging, just disgusting. And Martin Van Buren was Andrew Jackson's campaign advisor and the person responsible for a lot of that. And the person that Van Buren was slinging mud at and defaming was Charles Francis Adams' father, John Quincy Adams. So these two guys, together on the same ticket, willing to set aside their differences for this common goal, really tells you a lot about how dedicated to this cause they and many of the other people involved were. Well, I want to talk now about the ideology of the free soilers, which is known as free labor ideology. It would later be the ideology of the Republican Party, the modern Republican Party, when it was formed just a couple of years after this. All right, so the uh, free soilers believed that free labor is the basis of democracy. That where there's slavery, there's no true democracy. White laborers can't get jobs, and they suffer. People who subscribed to free labor ideology believed that, well, for one thing, everyone should be free to offer their labor at their terms in order to benefit from it. So free labor ideologists believed that everyone should have an equal opportunity to profit from their own labor. Now, when there is equal opportunity, they said, there is democracy. Because if you work really hard, you have the possibility of moving up the socioeconomic ladder, of improving your life. If you work hard enough, someday you can become a small business owner and be your own boss. Okay, so there's not, it's not a guarantee that everyone will succeed, but it's a guarantee everyone has a fair chance, an equal chance to succeed. And if you think about that, it makes sense that that would be one of the, one of the forming ideologies of the Republican Party, which basically was established when the free uh, soilers fell apart. They did really badly in that 1848 election. It makes sense because it is basically still, theoretically at least, the fundamental philosophy of the Republican Party, despite the fact that the Republicans and Democrats from 1850-1860 to now have completely switched uh, in a lot of ways because... 1850, 1860, the Democrats were the conservative party and the Republicans were the liberal party. But the Republicans had as their main basis, well, opposition to slavery uh, and also this free labor ideology, the idea that if everybody's given an equal opportunity, then with hard work and per perseverance, you have a chance to thrive and succeed and move up the socioeconomic ladder and improve your position, and one day you'll be the boss. Well, um, the result of this is that being opposed to slavery, if you lived in the North, became socially acceptable. 
It was not socially acceptable for abolitionists throughout the North, who had always been in the minority. I mean, even in places like Massachusetts and Ohio, abolitionists were constantly being beaten up by their neighbors because uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of racism. Okay, so uh, what this is saying, free labor ideology, is it's okay to be opposed to slavery expanding to the West, that doesn't mean you want to end it in the South, that doesn't mean you want to free the slaves, doesn't mean you care anything about the slaves, doesn't mean you're not racist. It means you want to improve things, improve the opportunities, improve the chances of working class white people, and that was socially acceptable. It was not, however, socially acceptable to the South because if slavery were forbidden, and all that new territory taken from Mexico, the South would gradually lose its political power. Right Now, if there were new states formed, like there eventually were, in, say, like uh, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and they were all free states, then the senators from uh, all of them would be, would be anti-slavery senators, uh, free state senators and congressmen. And so... The South would no longer have the political clout to protect slavery. So they were quite concerned about that. Well, the uh, 1848 election is held as promised. James K. Polk did not run for re-election. And in his place, the Democrats chose Lewis Cass of Michigan. The Whigs chose Zachary Taylor, the uh, hero general of the recent Mexican-U.S. War, and of the Second Seminole War before that, his running mate being Millard Fillmore, and the Free Soilers, Martin Van Buren and Charles Francis Adams. You can see that the Free Soilers got 10% of the vote. Okay, that's that's not a majority. But it is is respectable, one out of every 10 people. Uh, But that was not enough to win them any states or any electoral votes. Now, uh, the contest between Cass and Taylor was kind of close, but uh, Taylor came out the victor and became president. One of uh, the things that he was going to have to deal with within a year was the situation in California that we've already talked about. Around the time this is happening, uh, while the campaigns were being held for the uh, presidential election, Word was getting out about that gold strike in California, and people were starting to head out that way. And in no time, thousands and thousands and thousands of people were in California. So that within a year, they were able to have enough people to uh, try to get statehood. But there's a problem. Problem is that imaginary line. Let's uh, imagine it in our minds again, running from the top of Tennessee and Arkansas going westward, it, it intersects California. About, uh, about 60% of California was above that line and 40% was below it. So the natural uh, reaction to this would be uh, to divide it into two states. Except they couldn't do that because there weren't enough people living in the lower part uh, for that to be a state. Most of them were in the northern part where the gold was. And they wanted to come in with the whole thing uh, as one state. So this is a problem. How are you going to solve this? Because that compromise line of 1820 isn't going to help. Well, Henry Clay, 30 years uh, after the 1821, steps in again to work out a compromise. His compromise is let California come in as a free state. Um... Also, let us uh, uh, make the uh, northern states happy by banning the slave trade in the capital of Washington, D.C. Not banning slavery. It was still a slave area. You could still have slaves. But this was no more slave auctions right in the middle of Washington, D.C., right in front of the Capitol and the White House where all the visiting dignitaries can see it. Well, that's, uh, that's giving up uh, quite a bit. Uh, Also, the uh, compromise called for new territories, regardless of that 1820 line, new territories coming in as states, 
it should be left to popular sovereignty. That is, the people who live in this prospective new state should get to vote on whether they want to be a slave state or a free state. Now, the South didn't like that either. The South didn't like that either. They wanted everybody under that old line to have to be a slave state. Because if left up to a vote, why, it might not become a slave state. So how is this a compromise? The South's not getting anything. Here's what was given to the South. A very strict new fugitive slave law. Now, there have been fugitive slave laws on the books since the beginning of the country. That if a slave runs away to a free state, that slave's owners have the right to travel out there and look for them, or hire someone to look for them and bring them back if they can find them. But this new law goes farther than that, <clears throat> as we shall see in a moment. Well, uh, Zachary Taylor wasn't really uh, clear as to whether he supported Clay's compromise or not, but that became irrelevant when he died suddenly of a heart attack, leaving Millard Fillmore to step in as president, and he did uh, support Clay's compromise, got behind it, and that compromise was enacted. So here's that new slave act. Not only can slave catchers go to the northern states looking for runaways, any citizen nearby when the slave catchers were trying to apprehend the runaway had to help them subdue the slave. It was required by law. Now, one problem here, in addition to uh, the fact that a lot of people in the north didn't want to jump in and fight a slave to send them back to slavery, is that these slave catchers, I mean, they could claim someone was a slave on the vaguest of evidence. Uh, I'm looking for a runaway slave named Bob. He's between 5'8 five, uh, five and 5'11, and, and he's black. Hey, I think that's him right there. Let's grab him, right? Uh, so, uh, first question I want to ask, where is the state's rights in that? If you live in Massachusetts, and the people of Massachusetts don't want slavery... And now they're being required to help subdue runaway slaves, uh, which runs contrary to their previous policy. That's not states' rights. Also, if the South was really concerned about states' rights, they would have been in favor of popular sovereignty, wouldn't they? Because popular sovereignty basically means states' rights. That uh, new territories that wanted to become states, the people who lived there got to vote on it. But the South didn't want that. They wanted them to be forced to have slavery. So people still say, and many people still believe, the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. To which first I ask you, states' rights to do what? States' rights to have slavery. And secondly, what about these, these, just these two incidents, these two issues, the Fugitive Slave Act and popular sovereignty? The South was not supporting states' rights in those issues. The South supported states' rights when it protected slavery, and they opposed states' rights when it endangered slavery. So the South basically supported slavery. Many Northerners refused to obey this law. Uh, they would uh, turn away and uh, not help, or in, there were some cases of angry mobs of white Northerners in northern cities converging upon slave catchers and subduing them instead so that the black person could get away. And a lot of free blacks living in the northern states decided, you know what, this is, this is still not safe, so they went further north to Canada. All right, well, Compromise of 1850 uh, totally undoes the Compromise of 1820 and uh, doesn't really do a lot. It leaves things open to popular sovereignty, and it really really only lasted, it was only in effect, for four years. Um, in 1854, Senator from Illinois, Stephen Douglas, proposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was an act to make both Kansas and Nebraska new states. Both Kansas and Nebraska were north of that line of 1820. And that whole thing about popular sovereignty and the territories taken from Mexico didn't apply to them. They hadn't been taken from Mexico. They were part of the Louisiana Purchase, so the 1820 Compromise still applied to them. 
and the South wasn't happy with the idea of bringing in two new states from the free area, right? That's four new uh, pro-free state uh, or pro, uh, uh, pro-free pro anti-slave senators <clears throat> and however many congressmen. Now, now, Douglas, who was a Democrat, he wanted this because there was already talk about having a transcontinental railroad to link California to the east. And Douglas wanted that railroad to pass through the Midwest. Well, the, um, you know, not the far Midwest. Basically, he wanted to come through Illinois, which is his home state, so that Illinois would benefit. In order to do that, the railroad, if you went straight, would go west from Illinois out into the prairie. And that area was not, uh, it was part of, it was a territory. It was not a state. It was not really organized and you had to get approval you had to get approval from either the territory or the state to be able to do this and it would be easier to get that approval the whole process would be simpler if kansas and nebraska were states that's why that's how he wanted to bring them in but the south opposed that idea so douglas included in his bill the idea that all the or that these two new states kansas and nebraska also be given uh, popular sovereignty, like the new territories taken from Mexico, that Kansas and Nebraska get to vote whether to be slave states or not, which did violate the Compromise of 1820, but this act was passed, making the Compromise of 1820 essentially moot and opening the door for some serious problems. Meanwhile, look at that area in purple down there. Uh, that was part of Mexico. That's not a part that was taken in the war with the U.S. There were, there were other elements in the United States who wanted the Transcontinental Railroad that was being planned, not to go through the Midwest, but to go through the South, along the Mexican border, which means that it would start probably in uh, you know, Louisiana, uh, East Texas, well, actually, it would, all of these things start on the East Coast. Uh, one of the principal backers of this was Secretary of War, which today we call Secretary of Defense because it sounds nicer, Jefferson Davis. Now, if you don't know, Jefferson Davis would go on to become the president of the Confederacy. Well, uh, they wanted to get this land, this purple area, from Mexico so as to have that land available for that proposed railroad. So the South Carolina Railroad President, James Gadsden, was sent by Jefferson Davis to meet with the Mexican authorities. Who are the Mexican authorities? It's still Santa Ana, uh, who was reluctant to sell. But he was told by Gadsden that you'd better sell because quote, the spirit of the age, end quote, indicates that things are going to change soon. That the United States is going to be split into two countries, and it's the country to the south that you'll have to deal with. So, Gadsden was implying, it's us you're going to have to deal with, and you won't get such a good deal if it comes to that, if you turn us down now. So, Santa Ana sold them the land, and it was added to Arizona and New Mexico. Northern politicians didn't like it because they viewed it as an effort to spread slavery, and they were correct, but it was ratified. Now, remember when I said that the Kansas-Nebraska Act was going to open up all kinds of problems? The Act was passed in 1854. So Kansas and Nebraska are going to be able to petition for statehood. Throughout 1854 and 1855, people came pouring into Kansas. People came pouring into Kansas from Missouri and other slave states specifically so that they could vote as part of that state's vote on slavery. And they were all pro-slavery. So... You know, they weren't going to be there for long. 
weren't necessarily intending to stay. And at the same time, by the way, these people were called border ruffians because they were kind of rough in their approach. But at the same time, large numbers of people came pouring into Kansas from northern states, from free states. A lot of them came from Ohio, Ohio, Indiana. Why? So they could vote. So they could claim, hey, we're living in Kansas now. We're Kansas citizens. We get to vote on slavery. So, you know, just the, the population mushroomed. And uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was very tense. The border ruffians took a vote among themselves and claimed that they had, uh, they had won the vote. Uh, and so they were setting up a government, which President Pierce recognized. Um, at that time. Um, so you had uh, a rival government set up. You had a little miniature civil war going on in Kansas in the 1850s. And it was not just a rhetorical civil war. The town of Lawrence, Kansas, which I believe is where Kansas University is today, was kind of the, uh, the home territory, the home base of the anti-slavery people who were called Jayhawkers or Red Legs. Well, um, several uh, a large force of these border ruffians attacked the town of Lawrence, Kansas. They attacked it. Uh, they brought a cannon. They uh, uh, caused all kinds of damage. Nobody got killed. Well, I'll take that back. One person got killed. Uh, one of the border ruffians got killed when the cannon went off and it shot a building and a bunch of bricks flew up in the air and one fell on his head and killed him. Um, but there's going to be another attack on Lawrence in a few years when the Civil War starts that is going to be much deadlier than this. Nonetheless, this is pretty serious stuff. People going around blowing up buildings with cannons. And that was nothing compared to what was coming. Which brings us to this guy, John Brown, a fervent abolitionist. Uh, he and his sons were there in Kansas during this period, which was called Bleeding Kansas, is what this time period was called. He led uh, a group of anti-slavery people to attack the town of Potawatomi, which was one of the bases for the pro-slavery people. And they essentially came in and rounded up all the men, I think 14 years of age, and uh, rounded them up in the middle of the night. Now, John Brown, years ago when I took this class, 20 years ago, my professor, um, said Larry Whitaker, who has a very dry sense of humor, was talking about John Brown. I'll never forget it. He said, John Brown was a Christian man. Like many of us, John Brown asked himself, what would Jesus do? And, like many of us, he concluded Jesus would hack people to death with a broadsword, which is what happened to the people at Potawatomi. Uh, after that, Brown was involved at a large battle between border ruffians uh, and jayhawkers, um, pro and anti-slavery, at Osawatomi. The anti-slavery people, uh, the abolitionists, lost the battle but John Brown distinguished himself during the retreat by keeping it very organized, saving a lot of lives, and he became a big hero to the abolitionists and would in the future become an even greater hero to them and an even uh, greater um, diabolical figure to pro-slavery people. All right, well... Um, Spoiler alert, this is not going to end well. It's going to end in a civil war. So next time, we'll talk about the things that were going on out west during the civil war.